We're continuing our discussion of how the human soul functions. I'm here with Jesus and we're up to the principle of presence. So Jesus, can you tell us what the principle of presence is all about? Well, I thought I'd just read my notes first sure. for everyone and then we'll go through the notes perhaps one by one again. And um, we're wearing different colours because it's actually a different day. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke too much yesterday, yeah. so obviously that's why we're wearing different colours today. It's not like we had a half change <laughs> <laughs> through the day. But presence is the principle that for truth to be present and absorbed by the soul, love must also be present. So it's really talking about the presence of love. Mm -hmm. And a person who has truth in themselves, who honours the loving principle of the soul's free will, and who wishes to share some truth, under all circumstances this person will be able to tell you the truth about yourself if they have learnt the same truth about themselves. And this truth is present within their soul. So in other words, quite often I see people, and we can discuss these in more detail, but quite often we see people trying to share a truth with somebody, but they haven't even learnt that truth themselves, which means that they have no idea what they're talking about, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, B, will be able to logically describe the truth and define how it is the truth. In other words, they'll have a deep soul-based understanding which will, which will trigger their intellectual logic and be, they'll be able to describe to you logically why the, the thing they're sharing with you is, is the truth. Yeah. C, they will be able to tell you why the condition of error exists within you. In other words, if they are really developed in love, they will be able to feel what's going on in your life. They'll be able to feel what the source of your issues or problems are. And what they'll be able to do then is tell you uh, what was the underlying cause. And they'd want to do that too. They'd want to share that with you because they love you. Mm -hmm. So they, they, it, wouldn't, they, it wouldn't be like an attack of you. It would be a sharing of what they know about you based on what they can feel from you that you might not be able to feel from even from yourself. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, D will be able to show you how to remove this condition of error. So in other words, they'll be able to say to you, you know, this is what you need to do if you're going to actually address this particular problem. Yeah. In other words, they'll want to help you address the problem. They won't just attack you with the fact that you've got one yeah. and then leave you high and dry and, and, and feeling terrible about yourself without showing you what the potential solution is of this particular problem. Yeah. All right? And then E, will want to do all of the above while honouring your free will. In other words, if you said, I don't want to hear any more, then they would stop. They wouldn't keep going and keep, mm. atta or keep attacking or keep being uh, bombastic or, or, or pushy with the information. They would honour your free will instantly. And the other way I see that um, we can often tell that a person doesn't have the presence of love while they're speaking um, is and therefore doesn't have that truth within them, is that often they're trying to manipulate the person's will into stopping what they're doing. Correct. So they're, I'm telling you this, so you stop that. And Correct. And that, that goes out of harmony with yeah. love straight yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. And then the last point is love, compassion and understanding will be present and within their own soul while performing all of the above actions. Yeah. So in other words, they'll have love for you, compassion for you, and they'll understand most of it, and if not all, of what's going on for you during this process of the sharing of the truth. Yeah. Now, this is an indication that that person is, is firstly quite well developed in love, but secondly, also interested in loving you while they share the truth with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of people are not like this, of course. Most people, when they share truth, <laughs> quotation marks, with other people, it's very personally motivated. In other words, they're personally selfishly motivated. They're doing it for the reason of trying to stop something from happening in you that affects their life rather than doing it to help you uh, because you want help. Mm. Um, so most and people are not, uh, are not in the state of doing those things. Yeah. <coughs> it's also true that we might um, speak the truth just because we love the truth and to honour the truth in that situation, isn't it? It may not be specifically, I'm telling you this and now I'm going to help you through this whole big thing. Uh, but if, if the truth resides within me, I'll be able to honor, speak it with love mm. and, and be able to help that person if they are sincere about wanting, it, wanting help. So, th there, but are, I also, oh, so there are times when the person sort of is in a situation where no one in the room wants any truth but in order to honour the truth themselves, they must speak it 
but they wouldn't be speaking it in terms of trying to change anybody yeah. or trying to manipulate anybody or trying to make everybody feel bad about themselves or trying to judge everybody or for any yes. other purpose. They'd be doing it only because they must stay in a condition of truth in that particular place. They won't... Uh, and also, it's only when something becomes very, very unloving that you would consider doing that. So, so in other words, if everybody in the location was quite unloving to each other and, and there was a lot of other things going on, but, but they all wanted those interactions mm -hmm. and you were in the situation but you're in a state of truth, there's a high likelihood you would just sit in the situation, observe what's going on and you wouldn't say anything. Yes. Because, because nobody there wants to know anything from you mm -hmm. and they all want to remain in their condition that they're currently in yeah. and, there's, and there is no effect on you unless they personally interact with you. Yes. And now if they personally interact with you, now it may be a different type of interaction where you say, well, I can't agree with that, but I'm happy to sit here and listen to everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I, I can't agree with that because of these reasons that might come out. But that would probably only be needed if you were asked. Now, if everyone started to attack you in that situation, then obviously the person who's in harmony with love and truth would say, now, now all of you guys are getting out of hand now. You know, you, you're now attacking me for my, for my situation. I haven't been attacking you, even though I disagree with you. So this indicates to me that you're not very loving and, mm -hmm. and I don't really have any need to listen to you and the reality is I think it's time for me to leave rather than put up with this kind of stuff from you. Yeah. And, and it, but again, you wouldn't be angry or demanding or expecting that they change or any of these other things. You, you would have compassion for the fact that they wish to remain in that particular condition and you wouldn't feel de you know, uh, better than them or any of those things. You would just say, no, I can't, I can't do this here in this situation because... While you're attacking me, you're not being very nice to me and that's, that's something that I can't allow. Mm. So you would then probably leave the situation. So a person in truth is often very, very, you know, they're very, very connected with themselves and they are not angry with everybody all the time and they're not bitter with everyone all the time and they don't, don't get, you know, it's very rare for, for them. If, you know, once they're at one, we've got, you never get involved in bitter conversations or accusations because there's no need to. And, you know, if a person's that resistive to truth, then obviously there's no need for you to be involved with it. And under those circumstances, you would be quite completely, which is like the kind of situations that were surrounding my death in the first century. That was the reason why I was quite completely, because in that situation, nobody wanted to hear the truth. Nobody wanted to listen to what I had to say. Nobody cared about it. I was there by their force. Mm -hmm. There was nothing I could do about that unless I resorted to violence. And so the only action I could do was to not speak. Yeah. And so I didn't. Yeah. Um, and sometimes a person who's living in harmony truth won't speak. Yeah. No yeah. matter what the provocation. Mm. Mm. So really to summarise what you've just spoken about there, you're really saying that when a truth has been absorbed into us... So yes, now we, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. If it's inside of our soul, yeah. yes. Then whenever we um, are in any situation, mm -hmm. um, love with regards to that truth will guide us, like we'll have a loving attitude towards that truth, so we won't be forcing it and we won't... Won't be angry we about won't be the angry truth about itself it. um, we or won't, the fact that other people are in error about that truth. Yeah, and we won't try and force it upon others. No. But when we do present that truth, there will always be love within us yes. and we will be clear and calm and we'll be able to have a logical expression of it yes. and discussion of it should that be welcomed. And we would have compassion on top of that for the people who are listening yes. and their condition and the fact that they might not understand what we're talking about and so we'd probably sometimes have quite long discussions with them trying to explain. And the only time we would leave those discussions probably or ask them to leave if we had control of the room or the house or whatever it was yeah. would, be, would be if they had become unloving in their actions towards yes. us. Then, of course, we would go, well, now, now things are out of harmony with love, so I, I can't be here. Yeah. But even that wouldn't be an angry reaction. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Once we're at one with God, it won't be. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So let's contrast that with a person who doesn't have presence, if you like, who, yes. who doesn't understand presence. So a person who does not have truth in themselves, who does not honour the loving principle of the soul's free will, and who wishes to share some truth, in quotation marks now, mm -hmm. under any circumstance, will generally attempt to attack or denigrate you with their truth. Yeah. So that's very different. That's now an unloving act. Mm -hmm. They're trying, they might know something about you. So they, they, they might know something even that you're trying to keep secret or whatever. 
um, or that you feel ashamed of, and they purposely raise that particular thing in order to, for you to feel worse. Yeah. You know, that, that's their purpose, that's yeah. their underlying goal. Their underlying goal is to make you feel worse about yourself. Yeah. That's an indication of a person who has no love in them at all and who doesn't understand this principle of presence, right? They will attempt to belittle or humiliate you with their truth, right? They will have no logical idea or concept as to why their truth is what they believe the truth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. They will not be able to tell you why the condition of error exists within you because they have no idea and most probably a worse condition exists in themselves. Mm -hmm. They will not be able or want to show you how to remove the condition of error because basically they don't care about the fact that it exists. They just want to highlight it in order to attack you. Yeah. So they don't, they don't care that you have the condition and they also don't care you know, about helping you remove it. They mm. have no intention, in fact, of mm. helping you remove it. They'd like it to be worse, mm. <laughs> which is what they're trying to create or yeah. achieve. They're trying to make you feel worse and therefore have the condition worse. Now, you see this very, a lot with uh, this kind of attitude a lot with media interviews. They're constantly baiting people so that they get the reaction in the other person. That's an indication of a, of a person who doesn't want the truth. No. You know, a media person who wants the truth won't bait people. They will, they will you know, see the resistance and maybe point it out, yep. but they won't bait them and try to trigger them into rage or anger or some other emotion. Mm -hmm. they, they, would, they would allow the person to say, no, I don't want to answer that. And so they say, okay, you know, on the next question sort of, sort of thing. Yep. And just let that comment that the person doesn't want to engage speak for itself. Yes. And, yep. and the reality is there's not many media people like that who no. do that. No. They will honour, the person in error will not honour your free will to accept or reject the truth given. In other words, yeah. they won't honour your free will to even oftentimes speak. Yeah. But if they do allow you to speak, they will not honour your free will to say, no, I don't agree. Yeah. Or, or, you know, or to be in disharmony with what they believe. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the problem. And they will not be able to do any of the above with compassion, love mm -hmm. and understanding, because love, compassion and understanding are not present within their soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So when we examine this aspect of presence, it's really about the presence of love. Yeah. And the, a person cannot be the presence of love unless love exists within them to mm -hmm. some degree. Mm -hmm. And this is why most people have trouble with this particular aspect of the soul. They, they often are not, have no presence of love within them, even if they're seeking for truth. Many times there's not much of a presence of love inside of them. And so they become very angry, demanding, expect, you know, have hard expectations. And as a result, no truth can really enter them, nor can any truth be discussed without there being some discussion about the emotional condition that prevents the truth from entering them. Yeah, so, so let's, let's talk about this then, because really we're, now we're starting to talk about something else. So really um, you're saying that if, if a truth exists within our soul, mm -hmm. love will be present with it, that yeah. truth if in relation to that truth. If it's truly in our soul, yes. if it's not just an intellectual idea. Yeah. This is what the problem is for many. It's just an intellectual idea and, and, and it's not entered their soul yet. So it's not something their soul really feels. Yeah. It's something that they, they think is a good concept that they have honoured maybe through their intellect. But because it's not in their soul, because it's not something that's in them, inside of them, what they do is they have a tendency to, to relate a whole heap of information and a whole heap of what they believe is true. But there's no love in them at all mm -hmm. to allow for that truth to be discussed with them themselves. Yeah. Like they themselves are not going to be able to receive what's being said. Yeah. 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 And we've had uh, many examples of this. If some people look at some of the media interviews we've had, You'll see many examples of this. There was one young man who came to interview us um, at our home and, and he eventually walked off the interview. And the main reason why he did was because there was no presence in him, no presence of love in him. Mm -hmm. He had no desire to find out the truth at all. Mm -hmm. It was all about other addictive emotions that he was trying to satisfy. And as a result, it was impossible to share any truth with him, whether it was personal or you could see him even if it was not personal. He was there, you know, thinking about other things. He wasn't even listening to the conversation. Yep. There was nothing going into him. And a, a conversation like that is pointless. Yes. And then, of course, when it became personal, 
now he becomes defensive, angry, resistive, yeah. and all those kind of things, and starts a personal attack of myself and so forth. And, and that's an all, another indication that it's all, there's no, there's no desire in the man for any presence. There's no desire to love in the process. Yes, so this is, this is where uh, um, sort of you've been talking a lot about relating the truth and how when we relate the truth, love is present mm -hmm. if it's within our soul. Mm -hmm. And now you're all beginning to speak about how... Receiving it. Receiving the truth and how, that, how the presence or the lack of presence of love affects our receipt of truth. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying unless there is a presence of love within us... Or at least a desire to love within us. Yep. yep. So, a de so let's talk about what needs to be present yes. in order for us to receive truth. Well, uh, well, it's love that needs to be present in uh -huh. order for us to receive truth. So I think we've made that clear. But, but I feel there's aspects of love. That, yes, that that's person, what I'm asking. And that's what yeah. you're really asking, yeah. yeah. So it, it, some of the aspects of love are being open to a new concept. That's yeah. an aspect of love. Being open to the fact that there might be an emotional issue is yeah. an aspect of love. Being open to the fact that, that you might have resistance to the discussion of, an, of certain information is an aspect of love. Mm -hmm. If you're not open to such things, then there's no aspect of love in you or desire to love. Yeah. And as a result, it's impossible to really share truth with a person who's mm -hmm. like that. And the only circumstance where you would was is if they were in your presence, in, in your company, uh, then you would, you would. Or if they were at your home, which mm -hmm. in the case of this man, he was. Yeah. He was at my home. If it was at his home, I would have done something completely different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're the only times that you would probably engage it if you had control of the situation from an from a environmental perspective. Yeah. The other times you would probably just be quiet because you know that anything you say... Um, is not wanted anyway, yep. and uh, so you wouldn't probably engage. Yep. And they, the only thing they'd probably question after you left was, well, that man was a pretty quiet man, uh, didn't get to know him very well. <laughs> and, a lot of people, I've been with you in social situations where people have said that to me afterwards, gee whiz, he, he doesn't talk much. <laughs> and and um, of course I know that you're very sensitive to the will of everyone around you. Correct. If they don't want to hear from you, you don't talk to them. Yeah. And um, yeah. I often think that's that's funny that people have a perception that you're going to be a certain way in a social situation. Of course, because, uh, because in, you, when we share publicly, we're, yes. we're, we're making the presumption, and it's a valid presumption, yeah. that, that uh, people who come to listen to us speak want to learn about love. Yeah. And when we go to a social situation, I never make that presumption. No. I'm always going, well, what's happening here? What, what's their feelings coming yeah. from them? And the, if the feelings coming from them is they don't want to hear of me at all, then I don't say anything. Yeah. So the, sometimes we have whole, whole, whole evenings where I say nothing and yeah. they ask you a whole series of questions because they're interested in you, but they're not interested in me, so I don't say anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then they go away saying, oh, he was pretty quiet. I wonder what was going on with him. <laughs> and I say, well, they could have asked me that and I could have told them, but they didn't even want to know that. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 A person who's present with love would automatically be sensitive to those things. Mm. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so this, this aspect of presence and truth and the relationships, relationship between the presence of love and the, uh, really the presence of truth, that's, that, I'm getting all wordy, but <laughs> <laughs> that if love is not present, it's impossible to reflect truth, really. If you're going to honour... Well, yeah, you're really... All you're doing there is reflecting an intellectual concept yeah. from a memory-based, uh, you know, idea that you've heard from somebody that you liked. Yeah. You're not actually reflecting it from what your true condition mm. is. It's not something that you actually know. It's not something that you actually practice. And almost... It's, it's almost hypocritical. Yes. Because really it's just an intellectual concept you're sharing with from yourself to another person that you yourself don't yet have a sole perspective perspective of yeah. and you don't yet have ha, ha, you haven't yet absorbed it into your soul yeah so so <laughs> you're sort of sharing something that you just think is a great idea and then getting upset about it <laughs> when somebody <laughs> doesn't accept it which is actually the true condition of yourself yeah because when you get upset about it when someone doesn't accept it you're approving that your true condition of your soul is much darker than what you even thought it was before you started sharing that mm -hmm. truth mm -hmm. so yeah i feel a lot of people um, don't understand this principle of love-based interactions. So when you're present in love, and this is the aspect of the soul, the love has to be in your soul to yeah. be present in love. It yeah. can't be just an intellectual concept. Yeah. 
it has to be something that's actually driven by a real feeling inside yeah. of your soul because if not, you're going to slip up. Yeah. Sooner or later, they're going to say something and that gets you hot under the collar and then you'll say something back and there, bang, you're out of, you're yeah. out of the intellectual facade yeah. and, and you're into the real condition of your yeah. soul. And when you are actually feeling true presence and you're feeling the feeling of love inside yeah. of you, you don't do that. Yeah. I just want to talk to you about you saying when we when we are present in love and when we have true presence, and I get a bit thingy about that because there's a lot of natural what I would call new age philosophies that talk about presence yeah. and being a presence of love. And, and I'm not talking about the, any of those airy fairy concepts or ideas <laughs> you're, here. <laughs> you're really just talking about when love is present within us. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Love has to exist within your yep. soul. Yep. It has to be inside of you. Yep. When love is inside of you, now you can be loving with other people. Yep. You can't manufacture an idea or concept of love and be loving with someone if love doesn't exist with inside of you. Yep. Now, usually everybody has a degree of love inside of them to, you know, at, to some extent. And when mm -hmm. I say a degree of love, there are certain circumstances and situations where there's no resistance to love and, there's no, and there has been some absorption of truth where they are quite relaxed and able to show some or demonstrate some kind of love to another. For example, the average guy in Australia who drinks a bit, when he gets together with his mates and they all get together and have a bit of a drink, generally many of them are quite loving to each other at that point and sometimes even more loving than they would have been before they had the drink because the drink sort of loosened up their emotions a little yep. and now they start to display some of their true feelings for each other which uh -huh. are sometimes quite loving and matey yep. you know yep. and that's why a lot of them love to get together and have a drink because that's when they feel some flow of love between each other of course it requires uh, an addiction before it happens mm -hmm. but as soon as one of them starts saying something the other one doesn't agree with now because they're lubricated if you like by the alcohol now they quickly go from a bit of presence of love to no presence of love at all and now they're angry with each other and almost yeah. fight and sometimes they fight and sometimes they hurt each other you know yeah and that's why it switches so rapidly because on one subject you can be presence in present in love and, or have love or present. have some love present in that subject yeah but on another subject you can have none whatsoever yeah. and as soon as that particular subject gets triggered you've not loving at all mm. and 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 a person who's grown in love is is present with love on more and more and more subjects to eventually when you become at one with God you're present in love on all subjects yeah there's not a single subject that a person can raise with you that upsets you that makes you feel stressed out that makes you get angry that makes you feel afraid any of those things that's what happens when you become at one with God and up until that time you're a person in progression yeah right you're progressing with your soul and so you're learning how to become like that but mm -hmm. Uh, but it's only when love is inside of you that you are actually like that on any given subject. And a lot of the other principles we've been discussing in this series have been all about how to get love into your soul on certain issues, hasn't it? Yes. These, these issues of absorption and resistance and all yes. of those principles affect how we can actually become more present in love. Yes. So in but, the example that I gave, maybe, if we can give an example, yep. you know, if the two guys getting together, have a bit of drink, they feel real matey with each other, feel a fair bit of love flowing between them, they really like each other's company, and then all of a sudden some subject's brought up that one of them doesn't like, he gets all upset and angry and starts taking his anger and rage out on the other. Well, that's an indication that that particular subject for that man, he has a lot of resistance on. There's no soul absorption at all that has occurred on that yep. subject with truth yep. and obviously he has a lot of preclusive, preclusive emotions that preclude any soul absorption of truth on that subject. Yep. He, his true state on that subject will dominate him yep. and, and because it, his alcohol base there's less facade mm -hmm. and so now the true subject dominates him without facade and so he now is engaged in an angry exchange mm -hmm. and, and that is an indication that the truth does not exist in his soul on that subject. Even if he had had a drink if the truth existed in his soul on the subject, he wouldn't have got angry on that subject, no matter how challenging the subject is. Yeah, mm. yeah, got you, yeah. got you. All right, so, um, so basically my understanding is that when the truth is received into the soul, not just the intellect, mm -hmm. then love is also present 
or will come from us when we present this truth. Yes. That's the first thing we've established. Yeah. Well, can I also discuss another relationship there perhaps? Yeah. Because it, it's very important for people to understand some relationships between truth and love. Remember that truth opens your heart to love. Okay. So, so remember, humility opens your heart to truth and truth opens your heart to love. So if you have absorbed the truth inside of your soul, it's highly likely, if it's really there, it's highly likely you've also allowed some love to flow into you about that subject. Yes. Right? Because of the way the truth is the doorway to love. To love. It, it, it means that if you've allowed some truth on a given subject to flow into your soul, then it's highly likely you, you feel some love on that particular subject inside of your soul as well. And this is why the two often go hand in hand if they're in your soul. If there is a separation of love and truth in you and you're just reaming off intellectual ideas and there is no, like, it's, ov it's obvious there's no love in your soul about that subject, then it means that you probably haven't absorbed the truth in your soul about that subject and also no love has been able to flow into your soul about that subject. Yeah. And then the best course of action to take would be to find the emotional resistance that exists within your soul about that subject and work through the emotional reasons or the emotional feelings that caused you to preclude these emotions in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. yeah. And you're also saying there though that um, even when a certain truth may not be within our soul on, this, on a certain subject, yep. if there are other if love is present in other ways through our desire to grow or through our desire to um, even receive truth that we haven't previously got, mm -hmm. that almost creates a loving condition for the truth then to enter us. And without that, the truth is just, it's just going to be an intellectual discussion. Yes. Yeah. And, and really, all we're doing is we're, without the love being present in the soul and without truth being present in the soul, all we're really doing is just reaming off memory-based intellectual thoughts. In other words, there's things that have entered our mind that we remember and that we maybe even, from our mind's perspective, like the concept of, mm -hmm. um, but yet, as yet we don't personally practice them in our heart. We don't, in our soul, we're totally detuned de from them, in fact. And in fact, sometimes, because we love facades on Earth, there is a tendency to actually like that condition where the soul is in a completely different state than the intellect would tend to indicate, mm -hmm. uh, even to ourselves. And, uh, and we need to understand the difference between those two states mm. before we make any progress. Because while the soul is in a state of the resistance to the truth, and while it's in a state where it precludes the absorption of new truths and love, then it doesn't matter how much we talk about love and it doesn't matter how much we think about love and it doesn't matter how much we read about it and it doesn't matter how much we sh so-called share our life with others, there is not going to be any love coming from our soul. And, and until we remove the resistance, that will be the case. Yeah. And if, so if we don't remove it in 100 years, it'll be a case for 100 years. Sometimes I have this little uh, joke with you about people viewing you as a Google machine yeah. as, um, because sometimes we get in situations where people are continually asking you questions. Question after question. About after the universe, question. about God, about the spirit world, yeah. about even personal progression. Yeah. But there isn't a presence of a desire to really receive that, yeah, the that answers into, in an emotional way. Yes, it's quite funny sometimes because you know the feeling is quite strong. You can feel it quite strongly after a while. You can feel that that person has no desire to hear the answer. Mm -hmm. There is no love in them asking the question. And there's no desire for them to have a personal change from getting the response to the question. They're just asking the question. Yeah. And the only reason why I generally answer those questions in a group environment is because I can feel other people in the audience do have a feeling that yeah. they would want to know the answer to the question and they want to address the issue yeah. somehow, yeah. emotionally. Yeah. And then I'll share. If I feel that no one in the group or very few people in the group are wanting to hear that answer to that question, then I will focus the person who's asked the question on their emotional condition. Yeah. What, what's going on for them as to why they keep barraging me with questions, treating me like I'm a machine, wh while at the same time want, not wanting to know or feel about any of the answers I give them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it can almost be a sort of addiction, can't it, to just engage in the intellect around our progress, 
to help avoid where we're really at. Yeah. 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 I know yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah. So I, I find a lot of people um, who ask questions are asking questions in their addiction. So, you know, whether it be in their fear, in their shame, in their... Now, in some cases, I answer those questions because I feel like, well, no, there is an issue here for them that they need to address. If they can address it, if I can raise it and they can address it, that's being kind to them. Yep. Uh, and it's also sometimes driven by spirits who want to know such que uh, the answer to such questions. And so I feel like, well, now, now I've got a valid reason for answering this question. But when I feel that it's just a barrage of questions for the sake of getting information to allay certain addictions that they have or, or to meet certain addictions yep. they have, then I feel like, no, now we've got to focus on the addiction because unless I focus on the addiction, the aspect of preclusion means that, means that they will not absorb anything I'm saying to them. And it's like talking to a brick wall. Yeah. From my perspective, that's what it actually feels like. It actually feels like you're beating your head against <laughs> a brick wall going, <laughs> you know, with no result. Yeah. And, and that's what it's like talking to some people when it comes to, you know, giving them an answer to the questions they ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so if we discuss this principle from another angle now, sure, yeah, sure. Um, in the way that we might begin to analyse what's being presented to us. Yes. So given what you've said, if we are hearing something from someone and love is not present, mm -hmm. then how do we deal with that situation? Well, if we're hearing information from people where love is not present, they obviously have a motivation inside of them to bring up this information in order to attack us in some way or to humiliate us in some way or to denigrate us in some way or, or, or some other reason. Or they could be bringing up the information to meet one of their own addictions, mm. which is actually a selfish th act. So if... Firstly, we would need to look at two things. One thing is we need to look at why we receive such comments and criticisms. You see, there's obviously an aspect of love of ourselves that allow us to absorb error-based emotions from other people. And remember, if there is an error inside of us that, that precludes the truth from entering, or there's, a, there's no truth inside of us that exists to preclude an error from entering, then these errors where other people treat us badly and we accept them treating us badly will enter us. Mm. And so it's very important for us to, in those interactions to understand that obviously if I'm accepting something that's not given to me in love and it's not given to me, you know, with the desire to improve and it's not explanatory and it's all those, not all of those things we listed in the first section about presence, yep. then, then we can say to ourselves, well, Obviously, there's something else going on here, and I'm just allowing some abuse now. And what I need to do, and it doesn't matter what the person's saying, you know, what, what they think they're saying. It doesn't matter what they're saying. If I'm allowing abuse, then obviously there's a point of learning here for me about why I allow an error-based unloving feeling entering me all the time, and why I allow myself to be in a situation all the time where I'm getting attacked. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some times when you think about those issues where there might be a reason, and, and that is to demonstrate love to other people not, you know, who are, who are there yep. or other people who are watching. Yep. But, but that's about the only reasons why you would stay. And even then, you've got to be careful that you're not sacrificing yourself just for the sake of other people learning something. Uh -huh. so, so we'd have to analyse why we're sitting there allowing this barrage and what's actually going on. Because most of the time when we're in a situation where love is not present and we're allowing a barrage of information to come to us, it's usually because the, the person who's doing the barraging has actually, is emotionally manipulating us in, a, in some way or attempting to. And they're trying to elicit a response in us that is, you know, that, that they feel they wish to elicit. In other words, they're trying to drive us to a certain point, mm. whether that be to a point of agreement or whether it be to a point of anger mm. or rage or some other emotion that's unloving. Uh, even agreeing with them under those circumstances would be unloving. Mm -hmm. so, so this is where we have to be very careful that we're not being emotionally manipulated by a person who's unloving, yep. who, who quotes some intellectual idea or concept that is truthful to us and uses that as an excuse to be unloving towards us. Yeah. So, so if I can give an example, uh -huh. 
I had one media representative say to me that he could abuse me as much as I like because I, if I was Jesus, would forgive him. <laughs> now that's an example of a person who's emotionally manipulative, who does not understand the principle of forgiveness in their own soul, mm -hmm. and who has no as desire to love at all, and is willing to attack another people person, and then use a truth that he's heard intellectually against that person to cause them to accept such attack. Yeah. You know, that, you know that's highly manipulative, and it's totally out of line with any, any truth. Yep. And, and any question that the person asks under those circumstances, he's never going to hear the answer to. Mm. So, mm. so it's pointless having a discussion with such a person. Yeah, and I suppose there's a lot of examples I could bring up in this area mm -hmm. uh, where I see people excusing abuse, really, mm. um, using divine truth terminology, if I can call it that. I mm. know neither of us like to have a lot of terminology, terminology. but yeah. it does happen. But um, for example, I've heard people excuse their treatment of other people and saying, well, you attracted it. It's your law of attraction. Mm. So there's um, an example. Yeah. There's an example of a person with no presence, no yeah. love, no love is present there. They're basically blaming the other person for their abuse of the other person. Yes. That's, yeah. that's a very unloving thing to do. That, you know, basically a pedophile does that. Yeah. They blame the child for the sexual abuse of the child. Yeah. So, so you're not far removed from a pedophile when you start doing things like that, yeah. to be honest, in yeah. your soul condition. Yeah. So it's a very damaging thing to your soul to start using the excuse that because the other person attracted it, you can go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah. or that you don't need to look at what you did. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and it indicates there's no love present around even the understanding of the law of attraction. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. no understanding at all of the law in their soul. Yeah. They might have heard a few concepts yeah. and now they're, they're now distorting the truth of those mm. concepts in order to manipulate their other pers another person to absorb their abuse. Yeah. And that's a highly unloving act. Yeah. And, and in fact, anybody who engages in those acts has no understanding of the divine truth in their soul at all. Because yeah. if they did, if they had received some of God's love, they'd never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Never be able to do such a thing. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's other areas where I see people, I suppose when we have a lot of error inside of us and addictions, mm -hmm. it's easy to manipulate, easy to allow ourselves to get away with manipulating the things that you say. Yes. And so I was thinking uh, as you were speaking about an example of someone that I heard from who'd been in a workshop in, a, in their workplace mm -hmm. where, where some principles about... I don't know, we might call them natural love teachings. I don't like using that terminology either. We're being presented in a workshop format mm -hmm. and that person was obligated to be there for their work. Yep. They felt that there was no love present and so they were obligated to speak the truth mm -hmm. and they felt this person who was presenting it was being quite unloving. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I took issue with that because that person was um, not in control of that environment. Correct. Um, the person was doing their job and not forcing this material on the people. Correct. They were They were presenting what they were being asked to present. Yep. And the person in the audience was actually using the excuse of needing to stand up for truth when they, in fact, were being quite attacking and Correct. belligerent and taking away from the flow of this person who was simply just trying to do their job. In other words, the person claiming to be the person who had love yes. was actually one of the most unloving people in the room yeah. by standing up and interrupting the flow of the entire discussion and, and then affecting getting many other angry people. With, the, with that fact. And then potentially, I don't know whether he walked out or not, but I, I suspect that he may have. Uh, no, I don't no. think he did. He but stayed he along He stayed and to annoyed the them to yeah. the end, yeah. Yeah, which is one of the worst things you could ever do. You, yeah. you know, if you're going to, if you, if you felt that annoyed, you should leave. Yeah. And so then everyone can be relieved of your presence. Yeah. And that indicates how strongly there is no love inside of that person, even though they think they, there is. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose that's the thing that, Basically, from what you're saying, I feel that you're saying that if love is present when someone is presenting a truth, then we can trust that a lot. Well, uh, but it yep. depends a lot upon our understanding or our 
understandings of what love is because a lot of people And this will, is a problem. If yeah. love is not present in your soul, you don't understand what love is even if you think you do. Exactly. And this is the state that most people are in on the planet. They mm. think they know what love is when it's just full of addictive codependence mm -hmm. and they have no understanding what love is. So under the circumstances where we're sitting in an environment where we don't have to participate if we don't want to, where we don't even have to be there if we don't want to, and we're not forced to be there, someone isn't jailing us to be there, and we and are just speaking about things that we disagree with, then why would you choose to... Why would you feel that truth compels you to yeah, interrupt? There's no, truth yeah, doesn't, truth only compels you if you were in a situation where you had to speak up as a result of someone attacking you personally, and under those circumstances, you're not getting attacked personally. Yeah. You're just sitting there in an audience. You don't have to participate very much. If someone asks you to participate, we say, well, I, I don't know if I can because I, I don't know if I agree with everything that's being said. And then if they say, well, what don't you agree with? Then you, you have an opening and an opportunity to share what you don't disagree with, where, that you disagree, what you disagree with. But you don't have to then get all upset about it or mm. abusive about it or, and attack the person and constantly berate them and pull them down for the entire period, which is what I understand this person had a tendency to do. And, and when you do things like that, you're demonstrating that even though you've heard principles of divine truth, you know nothing about them, nothing about them. And you just think you know, and you're just, you're just parroting off memories that you've had of hearing it, and no love has entered your soul, and no truth has entered your soul, actually. Yeah. And, you, and if a person's in that condition, I would advise them to take a lot stronger look, an honest look, at their true condition of their soul, and a lot stronger look at all of the resistance that they have towards love. Mm. Mm. And I suppose I find it really sad that we, it's to talk about all these negative things mm -hmm. because it's such a beautiful principle. It's a wonderful and, principle. Yeah. And yet um, it seems like there's an abuse of the ideas of love and truth a lot. Well, I feel that most people on earth maybe don't have a feeling that, you know, I suppose you could say there are three classes of people uh, generally. There's the class of people who desire to love and they want to learn and they're quite open and humble. Then there's the class of people who think they want to love but they're not humble and they have no desire to learn yeah. but they think they do. Yeah. You know, so these are people who are often in a lot of facade and we meet a lot of those kind of people in our seminars. And then there's the kind of people who know they don't want to love, they just want to be angry and attacking and they want to abuse other people and they want to attack other people and they want to make fun of other people. Yeah. And they know they do. Yeah. <laughs> and in some ways I find them more honest yes. than the middle group. Because yeah. at least with those people you know where you stand when you're having a conversation. Yeah. Well, of course a person who's in harmony with love, who has presence in their soul with truth, they can tell the different types of people quite readily or easily. The problem is talking to those kind of people under those circumstances. You know, a person who knows they want to attack you, it's pretty obvious they want to attack you, right? Yeah. A person who wants to have the facade uh, of, of being nice while they're attacking you, then that kind of person is self-delusional and often very, very difficult to talk with and has no presence of love or truth in their soul yet, but they think they do. Yeah. And this is a very dangerous state. There's many people that have stayed in this state for many hundreds of years um, because they think they are wise and knowing and truthful and loving when the reality is it's just a, a, all of us are and their true condition is very, very different. Yeah, I believe that they're in the worst condition, or in the worst, maybe not the worst condition, but in the worst um, situation when it comes to growth. When we're addicted yes, to facade... Yes, they are most prone to stagnation. Yeah, when yes. we're addicted to facade, then yeah. we're, we're further away from progress than the person who just says, no, I'm angry yeah. and yeah, I'm and not hiding it. And also, I want to attack you and I want to abuse you. Yeah. Oftentimes, the person who says, I'm angry, I want to attack you, I want to abuse you, you know, they have oftentimes in, in history, and we've met many of them in the spirit world, where, they, where they've gone through some kind of change for some one reason, they wanted to love for one reason, and all of a sudden they realise their condition and they're just as passionate desiring love yes. as they were desiring to hate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they say, they switch from hating your guts to wanting to love you yeah. uh, without going through the middle road of being in a facade and making yeah. out they love you when they don't. Yeah. And oftentimes it is the people who make out things, who, who, who are facade, and who are trying to, to maintain and, and perpetrate their facade, they are the people who often have the most stagnation issues.
yeah. because they are often in a state where they've fooled themselves even about what their true condition is. Mm -hmm. And they are the people that are the most difficult to deal with, mm. actually, because you can't convince them that they are in the condition they're actually in. And, uh, and you've got to wait until they go through some kind of self you know, self-analysis and self-assessment, which they are prone to not do because they already believe they're in the right condition. Yeah. And so therefore they feel they don't need to do it. Yeah. And probably a fair majority of the people listening to Divine Truth at the moment are in that class where they're not honest about their true state or condition. They just like, they're in this state where they believe they would know everything, they believe they get it, and they believe they are being loving, they believe all these things about themselves, completely unwilling to look at their facade, and, and yet they're the, some of the most difficult people that there are to handle and mm. difficult people to interact with. The people we really love interacting with, of course, are the people who are open, honest, truthful about all of their condition, while at the same time they have some presence of love and desire to love at least. And because you can be, have a desire to love without having yet a presence of love. Mm. And, and even that is a better condition than a person who believes themselves to already be loving. Yeah. Um, so, so it's interesting. And, and sometimes historically, if you look at the spirit world, sometimes it's been those ones who are hateful and attacking, some even who caused my death who were hateful and attacking, uh, became just as passionate supporters <laughs> later <laughs> as they were passionate defenders of their own falsehoods before that time, they were so passionately defending their own falsehood before that time, they were willing to kill me. Mm. And then after they realized their, their error and, and went through a state of repentance, they become passionate supporters. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't go through this middle yeah. road of, you know, they acknowledged the error, they acknowledged what they did, they acknowledged their true condition and then made changes. And like even Cornelius was one of those persons who made so those kind of switches and changes. He wasn't a, fa a facade person at all. <laughs> so, so, you know, he, he was a good example of yes. a person like that. Yeah. Mm. And, it, and it seems to be that the injuries that create us having an investment in our facade, either towards ourselves or towards others or both, mm. are some of the most um, damaging to us really engaging with how the human soul functions. Yes. Because we do require that honesty, don't we? Yes. Uh, with ourselves and with others in order to just get the process going. Always. Yeah. Yeah, always. Yeah. And, and of course what we're trying to achieve here in this discussion about how the human soul functions is we're trying to help you, the listener, to, to actually see how your own soul has been created and functions and also help you have a bit better uh, self-assessment of your own soul and, and what is stopping it from growth and what's stopping it from progression. So that's our goal in these, all these conversations. Mm. 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 Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to, if you're happy, I'll just run through some sure. of the notes that sure. we made prior, just to make sure we've covered everything. Because yep. um, as I said, sometimes I feel like we get negative in talking about this stuff when actually, when you're with someone who has the presence of love, when they deliver truth, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and it's very rare that, like a person who has a presence of love and is delivering a truth. It's a it's a beautiful gift to be there. Yeah. Honestly, it's a beautiful gift. It's um, because because it is a rare thing. Yeah. And also, they have a pure desire, without any facade, to assist you, mm -hmm. to help you grow, to help you change, to help you get rid of what your resistance is emotionally. And why wouldn't you honour what they're saying under those circumstances? Yeah, and I suppose I'm one of the very, very fortunate people on the planet at the moment to receive a lot of truth in the presence of love, mm. and I do feel that. Yeah. And I feel the power of that. Yeah. I feel the um, how much easier it is actually to receive truth when love is coming with it. Yeah. And it inspires me a lot to be able to offer that gift to other people because it really is life-changing. And yeah. Um, yeah, I feel very passionately about yeah. that. When, it, when I receive a truth and love is not present, then I need to analyse it on its merits, yeah. of course, because yeah. I wouldn't be humble if I didn't. If yeah. someone gives me feedback or presents something to me and I can feel there's not love there, I don't dismiss it out of hand. No. Um, but when love is present, that is, yeah, it's just very beautiful. Yes. Obviously for myself, it's rare for me to yeah. present, for, for others to present to me any truth without 
there being a large degree of unloving behaviour associated with it, unfortunately. Yeah. And obviously I allow myself to feel about those kind of feelings rather than attacking the person in return. And, and I need to work through issues of self-love mm -hmm. that I obviously have yet to issue work through with those particular things. We have to be careful here with one particular aspect of this though. We find a lot of people uh, believe they are speaking with celestial spirits because they are so loving, in quotations, yeah. when the reality is they're speaking with spirits who, from the first fear who are manipulating them through their addictions. Mm -hmm. And quite often people on earth do believe that when a person, another person meets their addictions, it means that person is being loving to them. Yeah. And that is not true. If a person is meeting your addictions, they are not being loving to you, they are assisting you to remain separate from love and separate from truth. And so this is something where I find a lot of people really struggle with me because, because I will not be generally in a situation where I wish to meet a person's addictions. Mm -hmm. Now, under those circumstances, because most people believe that the meeting of addictions is the act of love, yeah. they then feel that I'm not very loving. Yeah. And I feel that that's something that they need to have a look at. Because the reality is a person who doesn't meet your addictions is the most loving person in the room mm -hmm. to, to you. And unfortunately on earth there are so many people who are engaged in constant addictive relationships that have become so used to having their addictions met that they believe the only way they get love is by having their addictions met. Yeah. And in fact that's not love, that's, that's a codependent bartering system and it's not the gift of love being offered to them, even though they may feel it is. Yeah. So I think we need to make that sort of caveat on this discussion. Definitely, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's why I sort of said earlier about it depends very much on how much love we we under, how much we really understand love, doesn't it? Yes, and, and the average person obviously doesn't understand love very much. No. So, <laughs> so we need to honour the fact that we don't. We, we've grown up in an environment that hasn't taught us anything about yeah. love. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's taught us a lot about codependent addictions. Yeah. But it hasn't taught us hardly anything about yeah. true, the gift of true love, the the gift of a of a of a love that doesn't require self sacrifice, but it doesn't require the sacrifice of others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know also um, because of my many addictions and fears that I've lived in resistance to for a long time. When I would be telling truth to people in the past, I was often in a lot of addiction myself. Yeah. And uh, what I know from that, and so my, my truth giving might go something like, I know what this is like for you, because uh, I've got all these issues as and bang, well. bang, there's the addiction. Yeah. So <laughs> that's me trying to say, yeah. um, it's okay, I'm, I'm with you and you're, you don't be confronted because I'm like you. Yes, you're already trying to pacify the potential response yeah. of the individual. Yeah. And this is an attempt to manipulate their response emotionally, their which is actually an attempt to manipulate their will, which is not loving. Yes. <laughs> and so I would go on like this and say, but you know you have this issue and that, you know, it comes from your childhood. So you know you're going to, you can work through and all this kind of, Pac Crap. Pacifist, yes. pacifying. It's like yes. giving a person a dummy. <laughs> like in Australia, a dummy is something you put in a baby's mouth so they can suck yeah. on and feel pacified. Like yeah. in the, I think in the States they call it a pacifier. a pacifier. And it's like giving a person a pacifier or a dummy so that they could <laughs> and feel nice and secure and safe uh, while they're hearing a whole heap of truth. Yes. Um, and a person and who my, loves you doesn't do that. No, no, because actually in that addiction, I'm fostering the lack of growth in both of us. Correct. I'm saying, I'm afraid of what's happening and I don't want to feel that. I'm yeah. afraid of even, it might not even be a real thing that might happen in you, yeah. but because I'm living in fear, I'm avoiding that. So I'm avoiding growth. And I'm also wanting to limit the amount you're going to grow through what I say, because there's not a full confrontation of the truth. Well, what, what, what I, it is, is that it, the true thing it is, is the expression of fear yes. in you. Yeah. The person who does that is not acknowledging their own fear. And their own fear is that if they share the truth, even if it's in a loving and gentle way, they feel the other person will have an overreaction to it and get angry and resentful. And then there'll be some kind of breakdown of their relationship in some way or some kind of feedback system where they no longer get their own addictions met. Yeah. Now, all that is, is an avoidance of your own feelings. 
Exactly. Which is actually not truth, no. <laughs> not the absorption of truth, no. and it's not loving. Exactly. If every time you try to avoid your own feelings, even the feelings of being potentially attacked, if you try to avoid them, then you're not in a loving state. Exactly. So, so it's very counterproductive to, to attempt to share truth with a person in that manner and at the, then, then at the same time uh, try to pacify their response. Yeah. And, in, and the fact is that a lot of people need to have an angry response to feel their own resistance. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I was going to go on to say. So what I notice in, tho in those interactions that I had in the past, I, everyone, you know, not everyone, but a lot of th people thought I was a very nice lady. Yes, of course. And um, that was my aim. <laughs> which was aim. your aim. <laughs> and they thought I was quite loving and of course, kind. which was your aim as which well. Which was also my aim. <laughs> but it wasn't the truth because no. I was, as you've just pointed out, living in my fear. Yeah. Now, and it's not when, loving to feed their addictions or your own. Exactly. So you weren't being loving. I wasn't being loving mm. in any way. Mm. Now, I have grown a bit from that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel much clearer now about when I'm going to speak to someone and I do that in the context of situations where they, we already have a, an understanding that they want to receive truth from me. So yes. I don't do it with the supermarket checkout girl. Yeah. But if I'm in an interaction with a person who's already said to me, look, I want to grow in love, yeah. then, I, then I'll be clear and direct with them yes. about what I see is going on. Yes. So that means that I just say, well, I said to someone yesterday, you are just incredibly angry with men. <laughs> you, it is comes out of you like a huge barrage. Yeah. And and in, in this case, I said, I don't actually know the exact causes, but I can tell you that that's what comes out of you. Yeah. And I do know the process you're going to have to go through in order to find the cause. Yeah. And didn't you also say that, that you could feel in her a feeling that if a, if, a, if a person has a penis, then it means they should be attacked. <laughs> yes. I mean, I was very clear and direct with this person yeah. um, because I know that it's taken... Uh, well, I know the power of receiving that truth from someone who's not judging you. And yes. I didn't feel any sense of judgment towards her. Yes. But I felt that it was actually an act of love to give her this awareness. Yes. Uh, um, and five years ago, that I... I would have frozen in terror at even being able to speak that so directly. Yes. To and remember your emails five years ago, you'd do two or three pages of email that didn't really say anything <laughs> at all and wasn't direct at all. And hope they'd and, get it. And hope they'd get it. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, you know, two or three paragraphs of email with very point, you know, yeah. each point very clear and, and, and being afraid when you click the send button. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But mm. also recognising exactly what you said, that... I personally have had a lot of resistance to a lot of things. Yeah. I've had to get angry. And I, I know now that my brothers and sisters out there, sometimes they're going to need to go through anger in yeah. order to just... Like, my anger was a big indication to me. When I realised I'm angry, I couldn't deny I had a problem anymore. Exactly. I wanted to deny it. Well, but uh, uh, shall we say, a self-reflective person who gets angry can't deny that they have a problem anymore. Yeah. But a non-self-reflective person <laughs> who gets angry usually does deny that they have a problem and usually thinks that everyone else is the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but obviously, yeah, if, you try, if you're attempting to grow in love and you're self-reflective, one in the key indicator that you're very resistive is, is your anger. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I suppose in those interactions, I don't get as many people believing that I'm a loving, nice, kind girl. Of course. But actually, I'm more confident because I feel the love inside of me when I do, when I am able to communicate in that way. I know I'm not judging. I actually do have compassion because, yeah. hey, I've been the person in resistance. Exactly. Um, and so, and I also have been the person who's received the truth with the presence of love and it's changed me. Yeah. And so I feel much more... Confident, not in every situation. No. I'm not without addiction. It's a growing thing, isn't it? Yes, yes. yeah. Mm. But very many more people feel very much that I'm not loving in yes. that state. And they believe their celestial guides are more loving than that because it's all very gentle and kind. And, and I feel there's no lack of gentleness here. Exactly, exactly. And the reality is true celestial spirit communication involves a lot of very, very frank conversation. With that's a lot what of love. I say, yeah. And and if if that is not is not occurring, yeah. then it's totally because the person has an addiction with the first fear spirit, who they probably believe is a celestial spirit, yeah. and they they are receiving information from a first fear spirit, feeding their addictions, and they go, "Isn't it wonderful? I get all of my addictions met by these spirits. I think I'll call them my guides, and I think <laughs> I'll call them celestial spirits, so that I can feel good about it." And honestly, you're just being in self delusion. 
yeah. in that state. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a pointless state, actually, for your own progression. Mm. You know, it's far better to acknowledge that, yes, there is a lot of hard things that you're going to have to acknowledge about yourself and your own condition, and the sooner you do it, the better. Yeah. And the sooner you allow yourself to see that your concept of love is completely different than God's, the faster you're going to mm. progress. Yeah. It's certainly an issue that's affected the the clarity of my mediumship as a medium. Mm. While I still have addictions and fears of people's responses, I know, my, my guides tell me and the celestial spirits that come to speak through me tell me, mm. we're not able to say everything we want. Like yeah. they want to be direct and exactly. clear and straight to the point because they yeah. know that's the only way you, a person, that maximises their potential yeah. for growth for a person. Exactly. Um, but my fear of, of public opinion often limits their ability to do that. And yes. it's something that I feel quite, um, it's an ethical issue for myself. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. If, if a person reflects upon the fact that all celestial spirits want to help you get beyond your resistance, they want to see, help you see that what is dominating your soul at the moment mostly is your unhealed emotional state. They want to help you get past the preclusive concepts that you have inside of yourself that stop you from progression. And they want to help you start absorbing some more truth. Now to do that, they have to confront within you all of the error. And to do that, they're going to have to be quite strong about it because you don't want to confront all of the truth within you. Most of us have no desire to confront it uh, at the beginning of our you know, endeavour to grow. And we have no desire to confront it. So, so they have to help us through this process. And so their attempts are always trying to help us get to the state where they can be frank with us. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that most people who think they're communicating to celestial spirits feel they're nice and gentle, the reality is that, that the majority of celestial spirits, if they did come to speak with people on earth, the people on earth would believe them to not be gentle. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the people who they believe are gentle are actually in addiction with them and are actually first fear spirits just wanting to get some of their own addictions met mm -hmm. through a codependent relationship. So I find that's, that is very, very common, commonly happening even now. And it will continue to do so while a person remains completely in the state where they wish to avoid any confrontation of their own condition. Yeah, mm. because it's also true, isn't it, that if we're sensitive to the presence of love, then that confusion doesn't happen at all. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because the bigger presence of a celestial spirit is, the biggest presence is love. And Correct. if we are open yeah. to that and sensitive to that, we can, we can discern so easily, yes. hey. Um, and they will say very truthful things to you. Yeah. And they won't skirt around any issues. They're very direct. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if they, they will give you one-liners and if you don't take them, they'll go, okay. That's, that's all I'm going to say about the subject and off they go. You know, they're not the kind of people that hang around sometimes like I do and talk to you for an hour <laughs> trying, to, trying to help you see the issue. Generally, they'll, uh, they'll just say, no, well, you don't want to see the issue. That's fine. That's your call. Yeah. Um, I'll go and help somebody who does yeah. want to see the issue. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is something we need to learn on Earth too. You know, we need to stop spending as much time with people who have no desire to grow, mm -hmm. no desire for progression, mm -hmm. and we need to spend more time with the people who have a true desire to grow and to progress. And this is one reason why we've started to have less seminars sometimes lately, because we can feel that the people have reached a point of intellectual saturation of material mm. without there being any true motive to grow. Yeah. And that, that's an issue, you know, and we want to go and spend time with the people who have a true motive to grow. Yeah. And, and that means doing things like this, because things like this are great, because, because it's only the people who have a true motive to grow that might listen to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the other people will look at it and go, oh, I don't want to know about that. That all sounds all pretty theoretical to me, you know, <laughs> and they'll go on something else. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose it's something that um, we're trying to focus on a lot of the content, aren't we, so that yeah. it's, a, it's a resource in, in time to come and for... Correct whoever might want to pick it up at, at a certain time yes. and, and have a so look. We, we feel quite strongly there are quite a lot of people on this planet who do have a true desire to grow but at the moment are quite disillusioned about growth and feel that maybe growth isn't possible and and the more we can share sooner or later and um, the information will get out out there uh, through all sorts of communication mechanisms yeah. 
And eventually all of the people who are on Facebook who are unloving to each other, even though they call it a divine truth forum or whatever, all of those kind of people will realise, well, I am being unloving to my brother or sister and, and it feels like I'm being unloving and they feel yeah. like I'm being unloving. And we're not, you know, we're here trying to attack each other and denigrate each other, which is actually not the presence of love. And then they will start questioning perhaps their own, mm. you know, they have some kind of more, more rapid and more honest self-assessment and that that would be fantastic but the presence of love should be the way that any person who's sincere about growing measures somebody's true intention for them mm -hmm. so so if if i can feel in another person that they they are loving when they try to talk with me about a subject i will listen to them for hours yeah right even if i disagree with everything they say yeah i'll i'll communicate with them for hours if a person comes to me thinking they want some kind of truth, but at the same time are very unloving to me, you know, it, it, it will be lucky to have a five-minute interaction, to, to, to be frank. Yeah. Because cause they, there's no desire for love, there's no desire for growth, there's no real desire for truth, and, and their soul precludes the absorption of any new information that could help them out of that state. Yeah. So what's the point of spending any time? Yeah. Not much point. Yeah. 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 And perhaps an important thing that you just touched on there, you were saying that it's important that, um, you know, when the presence, when someone has a presence of love, then great, let's spend time with them. But you also mentioned about the ability for us to self-reflect when we are interacting with others. Do I feel present with love right now? Mm. And if I don't, then... then should I really be speaking? Yeah, should I really open my mouth? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, you know... Like I feel quite strongly that we have, an in, we have a mind and obviously we've talked about the mind a bit and, and we can utilise this mind to shut up <laughs> when we need to shut up. Yeah. And when we need to shut up is when we don't feel loving. Yeah. That's when we need to shut up really because we need to go away and, and go through the emotional reasons why we feel so unloving and we feel like we want to speak up in an unloving way. Mm. You know, that's the best time to shut up in yeah. fact. And... and even if we believe we're being loving and people around us feel that we're not loving, then just analyse two things. Are we meeting their addictions or, or not? Yep. If we're meeting their addictions and they feel that we're being unloving, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that's true. Yeah. If we're meeting their addictions and they feel we're being loving, that that's false. Yeah. And if we're, meeting, if we're not meeting their addictions and they think we're being loving, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And if we're, you know, so, you know, these things we need to consider, like, yeah. what are the interactions with the individuals? So what's going on with the, you know, with the personal interactions? But we're best keeping our mouth shut when we can feel within us an unloving emotion because it's not going to end very well, generally. No, <laughs> no, it's not. And, and we can end up doing more damage to ourselves yeah. and to the people around us. Yeah. Uh, because we're just lacking the sincerity to just say, look, and I'm we're not far in the state too, where we're going to learn anything. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm far too invested in speaking right now. Yeah. There's and you can just say, look, like, you know, I can feel I'm just getting angry about this subject yeah. now and I've just got to go away and have a good <laughs> feel about what, why I'm so angry about it, you know, yeah. what, what's causing me to feel so angry yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 All right, well, that's a great, um, I think, discussion about presence. Yeah, have we discussed most of the points yes, that were raised? Yes, yeah. that we had made a note of. Yeah. Um, just, we'd mentioned that without love we can analyse the message on its merits. I think we covered that. Um, yes, I feel we still have the capacity intellectually to analyse uh, a message and to determine whether it has a degree of truth or not that we need to perhaps feel about. Yeah. Um, it, it's not always the case that we can do so, of course. And for example, if a person is purposely raising an issue of truth with you to point out one of your errors that you don't want to know about, mm -hmm. then they are obviously being unloving. But let's say you do want to know about it um, and they are pointing it out to you and you do want to know about it, but they are being unloving. You've got to be very careful about absorbing their emotion that comes with that so-called mm. truth. Now, the fact that you're sitting there already absorbing it is an indication that the error, the real error, not the, is not the one they're discussing with you. Yep. But actually, the real error is that you're sitting there absorbing a heap of 
you know, very damaging and abusive emotions while they're discussing it with you. And that would be the truth you would be focused on. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so sometimes I'm in situations where a person's telling me a whole heap of things about myself that I know are completely untrue. But I'm, I'm wondering why I'm, why I'm sitting there and absorbing it, right? Because that's the truth I need to look at. Mm -hmm. why, why am I still sitting here absorbing it? Why am I still attracting this kind of a person? And why do they think they can get away with this kind of a discussion uh, inside of their soul? There's got to be something in my soul that's allowing this to flow and allowing them to attack me in some way without there being some... So there must be a hole there some yeah. kind of error inside of my soul that allows this process to occur. And that's the truth I need to focus on. Yeah. So they might be speaking and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking about something completely different <laughs> and, and I can see I've got a problem with that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. the thing you're speaking about, but yeah. the thing that uh, is demonstrable through the emotional condition. I yeah. must say it's very humbling for me at times to experience a difference of what is attracted when I'm with you and when I'm not with you. Yeah. Because there is such a strong presence of love and truth within you that very often people just don't feel okay to behave in ways that they still feel okay to behave around me yeah. in terms of a lack of love or a lack of truth. And yes. that's to do with my fears and the unhealed emotions and my addictions and things. Yes. Yeah. And that's why sometimes, you know, people don't speak up very much at a group where they, would, they normally speak behind our back, mm -hmm. but when it comes to you know, a group, they might attend a group, but they won't say the things they said to us behind our back because they can automatically feel the presence of love there and the presence of truth there, and they automatically feel that they are out of harmony with love if they say something, and, that they, and so they don't say anything. But then because their dominance of their soul is they still want to be out of harmony with love, when they go away from that situation, their soul dominates and they speak up the unloving thing that they always have felt, felt but yeah. they never felt in my presence that they could say. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I think that's all that we had that we wanted to speak about sure. presence. Yeah. But basically, to summarise, you've basically explained that when someone has the truth within their soul, they'll be able to express that truth with love, they'll yep. be able to explain it clearly, the causes for it, and... Um, how to remove it, they'll honour the free will of the individual that they're communicating with. And they'll have understanding and compassion while they're doing it. While they're doing it. Yeah. And something I think you spoke about with Luli and you've mentioned again today was just that you can be um, in a progression of in course. terms of the, the presence of love. So well, we're, we're, if we're a progressive soul, which, we've, which is one of the principles of the soul's functions, yeah. you know, obviously we're in a state of progression. That means that we're not going to be perfect on any of these points until we're at one with God. Yep. So, so what we've got to come to see is that, is that at any one point in time, we are in different states with regard to these particular functions of the soul. Yep. And until we become at one with God, that will remain the case. Mm. So we're not going to be able to be perfected in love until the time that God, we're at one with God. Yeah. And, but, but if we allow ourselves to understand these particular principles of the, how the soul functions, we have, a, we have a way to become at one with God. Yes. And we start to e e more accurately examine the underlying things that are going on within our soul that cause us to not be at one with God. Yeah. And this allows us to have a true self-assessment of yeah. our own condition. So I feel that's what's essential here, to, to be able to see yourself as you truly are and to understand how to get from where you truly are to becoming at one with God where you are 100% of the time present in love no. and 100% of the time understanding how the soul functions mm. all the time. Like you don't, and then after that point, it's no longer a theory, it's fact, and so you don't need the theory anymore, yes. obviously. Yeah. Um, and so every celestial spirit knows all of these principles we're discussing about how the human soul functions and feels that, yes, why do we need to discuss them? Because <laughs> we all know how it works. <laughs> you know, yeah. a, we yeah. don't need to discuss them anymore. You, you know because it's now in your soul. Yeah. Even the knowledge of how your own soul functions is in your soul now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a beautiful place to be at, obviously, because it enables you after that point to grow even more rapidly uh, because there's obviously still growth after you become one with God in terms of the condition. And, and this enables you to make this progress because you now 
fully understand in your soul as emotions how the soul itself functions so, and so, so therefore you know fully in your soul how to grow after that point yeah you don't need the assistance of another to help you grow although that assistance is still kindly offered yes obviously yeah, yeah. and the, okay and the other thing i suppose you said conversely was mm -hmm. that you talked about ways we can analyze whether there is a presence of love mm -hmm. with the truth being delivered and mm -hmm. so when there's things like attack belittling humiliation mm -hmm. um, character no, assassination yep no logical flow like ideas able to be presented or mm -hmm. being presented or demonstrated even mm -hmm. um, and, and attempts to manipulate your free will mm -hmm. if all of those things are being done or said in the context of sharing a supposed truth mm -hmm then it's safe for us to analyse it. Well, that, whatever's being presented, we need to consider. Yeah, potentially uh, consider. Uh, yes, but mm. we need to consider in the light of the fact that we know that love is not present with what's Correct. being presented. So, so we have something to work on about why isn't love present. Yep. Yep. Because obviously if love is not being reflected towards us, there is usually a reason within us, not mm. always, but usually a reason within us that allows that to occur. Uh, and, and if it's happening all the time, then we need to examine that. Yeah. I need to state, though, in that second part, yeah. as a caveat, if you like, yeah. as well, that many people believe their character is being assassinated when it is not, yes. when it's just a statement of truth. For example, a celestial spirit will go to a person in the hell and say, you are a liar, a scoundrel and a cheat. And they have been all of those things. And that is a statement of truth. <laughs> The celestial spirit's not trying to character assassinate the individual. Yeah. He's just trying to help the person come to a condition where they see their true state. Similar uh, to the discussion I had with the lady yesterday where I was saying, look, I feel like if someone's got a penis, they're in trouble when it comes to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was not an attempt to uh, assassinate, assassinate her, her character. character. Uh, I wasn't trying to say, and that makes you a bad person. No. I was just saying, and this, this is, is the truth. truth. And this is the state you're currently in. Yeah. So we've got to be very, very careful. See, most people don't have a, the ability to correctly assess when a person is making a statement that they don't like to hear. Mm -hmm. They often want to believe the motive is bad when it may not be. Yeah. And this is a problem that many people on earth face. We often want the motive of a person who's telling us the truth to be bad so that we can ignore the truth they're telling us. Yeah. And we've got to be very careful about such motivations. Yeah, because yeah. they are all errors. Yes. And therefore they all preclude the absorption of more truth. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that discussion. Yeah, we'll it was a good discussion about, about that aspect of presence, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. And the necessity for love to be present, for truth to really exist. Yes. And, yeah. and for, for both love and truth, if both love and truth are present, you have a great ability to grow, yeah. a much better ability than if just truth is present without love. <laughs>